system on the outside, not in here. And so, uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to psych myself up for this. This is, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, I'm excited today. We're going to get, get done with, uh, I'm going to give you an example of a mixture model, a really useful one that'll set up your homework, um, which is already up on the website. And, uh, I want to get started with the conceptual part of multi-level models. It gives us a little bit of a head start so we can do more quality time with the actual processing of them in the next two weeks. Because we only got two weeks left. Uh, it's going to be all multi-level models. So um, that's the agenda. And that is exciting to me. And I know to some of you, too, you're like, when does the class begin? <laughs> right? Because you have some of this stuff and you're like ready for the multi-level stuff. It's coming. But it's just I'm paving the way. And... Uh, it's good to have um, it's good to have a, 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 a kind of methodological introduction to the more basic forms that underpin it. Okay. Yes. Are we going to get any feedback on the homework before we get to the final? Just in case there's like mistakes that we keep doing, but we're not aware of mm. uh, The question was: Are you going to get feedback on the homework? Uh, first answer: No. <laughs> Second answer: <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's there's a lot of you, <laughs> and I do pretty detailed. Solution sets and that, but if any of you have uh, particular concerns about something like you do the comparisons between your solutions and the others, and you're you're wondering like, oh, is this a big deal? Uh, then by all means, contact me, and I'll try to fit you in. Lately, and some of you've been trying to meet with me, and you know my, my calendar is incredibly impacted right now. But as February ends, it'll get better. Uh, I think one of my questions might also relate to that would be if there's like pet peeves of how we're writing up our like our homeworks that are just really annoying, but we don't know it because we're not being recorded. Those, that's probably not true because Paul, when Paul's been annoyed, he's been emailing okay. people individually okay. and saying, yo dog, don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you haven't received a grumpy okay. Paul email, and I know some of you have, because <laughs> um, he usually blind CCs me <laughs> 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 um, okay. But in general, you guys are doing your homework great. A lot of you are using Markdown, which is wonderful, and I haven't pushed that uh, just because I, I wanted to reduce cognitive load. But I think it's a great Markdown script because it self documents for you later on. I mean, if future you, I was, there were some of you in my office hours uh, earlier today, and I was telling you that future you will not know the things that current you does. So future you will want to go back in time and make an, and an interview with current you. And your notes, when you really document uh, your model code, you, uh, you do that for future you. Doing in future you a favor. So, uh, my model notes are like that uh, for my published papers, like there's just huge amounts of comments uh, in them. And um, Markdown's nice because it sort of encourages that documentation. It makes it natural and free form. So, is Markdown a thing or is it just sort of found in comments? Your Markdown's a thing. Uh, well, that's a weird thing. Everything's a thing. But, uh, what's that? What's the word people from Philadelphia use for thing? I forget. What we hit what? Yeah, exactly. So it just means thing, right? Doesn't it? Uh, anyway, so it's more than a thing. It's a system. It's a system of, anyway, Google it. Markdown. R Markdown. Google it. And I know there's some real pros of it uh, in the class, so they, they might help you with it if you want. But I'm not pushing it on you necessarily, but it, it really does help in, increase your, your sanity reservoir uh, sometimes. So it's a good idea. Questions? That, do you like, do you comment within Markdown better than just commenting? Uh, well, it makes a prettier comments. document, so it's like you're writing, I mean, you can, you can write a public paper in Markdown, and it has all the R code in it, and it'll get executed as you as you rerun the document. So it's it's a great thing for helping document and replicate analyses. And when your colleagues, look at it, then yeah, it's exactly. So it's a good system, and it's caught on really fast for that reason. Um, and then when your colleagues want to know how you did it, you just send them the source file for the whole paper, and it's got all the R code in there. It's great. Um, yeah, that said, when you're running when you're running Markov chain models that you know take take eight days to sample, you don't put that in your Markdown. <laughs> but uh, so lately, I haven't been using it very much for that reason because those are the models I've been running. Uh, they literally, I just waited two weeks for a model to finish mixing. But uh, hey, you know, uh, there are exceptions to all workflows. Anyway, other questions for you going here? I know the people who aren't in the class and have been watching the lectures love these weird stories at the beginning, right? <laughs> people have babies and <laughs> all kinds of stuff happens. Um, okay, what are we actually doing? Um, today, we're going to start with mixtures. And uh, uh, mi mixtures are also hybrid models. They have 
uh, multiple stochastic processes, that is, you might think of them as likelihood functions, uh, but the measurements that we have available have mixed those different processes together. I'll say this again. Uh, there are models that contain more than one likelihood function, so there's one more, more than one stochastic process that's generating observations in the world, but the, our ability to measure those processes has produced a mixture of those processes, so we can't easily disentangle them just from the raw data. And I'll give you an example of how that happens. Um, one of the most common uh, cases in which this happens, and we'll inspect this next week, is the case of over-dispersed counts. Uh, so remember when I introduced count variables like the binomial and the Poisson, I said that for all counts, the variance scales with the mean. The, the greater the magnitude of it, the greater the variance in those counts. And that arises naturally from the maximum entropy nature of count data. Uh, when we observe counts in the real world, and we make a count variable, typically that variance that we measure, um, even after conditioning of all the available predictors, is in excess of the expected variation given the mean. And uh, that is often called over-dispersion. The counts are dispersed. They're wider than we'd expect if they were all from the same homogeneous process. And that's because nature has heterogeneous processes that generate variation underneath it. And you can very usefully model over-dispersion with mixture models. Um, and the most classic ones are the beta binomial and gamma Poisson, and there are worked examples of those at the end of the count chapter. I'm not going to lecture on them, uh, and I used to, uh, and I'm not going to lecture on them, partly because um, they're not nearly as useful as they used to be, uh, because now we can do exactly the same thing with multi-level models, so I'd rather punt on that until next week and give you a multi-level example. That will help broaden your understanding of what you can do with multi-level models, but multi-level models are our way to get heterogeneity into any level of the process uh, that's generating the data. And that's what these sorts of mixtures are. Beta binomial and gamma Poisson um, used to be the only game in town because we didn't used to have Markov chains, so we couldn't fit arbitrary multi-level models in. And the beta binomial and gamma Poisson have this conjugate structure that makes them easy. They're integrals that can be closed analytically, and then it's easy. I say something about this in the notes if you're interested. You'll come across people using them. They're, they're still very useful models. Uh, they're sometimes pretty tricky to fit the data, though, and, and ironically, complicated multi-level models are easier to fit the data than those in my experience. Uh, it's, it's a weird thing about them. Um, so we're going to spend time instead in class on zero inflated mixtures, which are incredibly common, and I think more common than people notice. So I want to draw your attention to them in a toy example, and then your homework has a, 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 a parks management example. I call the homework problem parks and estimation. Uh, <laughs> um, so here's the uh, toy example in class, and this will this will be an example that also lets me re-emphasize to you the value of simulating dummy data to help you understand models. So we're gonna we're gonna do the model forward and get data out of it, and then we're gonna do it backwards and get parameters back out of the data. Uh, this is a great thing when you're debugging your code to do to reassure yourself that you have written the model right. Uh, so here's how here's the setup. Um, I want to imagine that imagine you're a monastery tycoon. You own a number of monasteries, and uh, these things used to be monastery tycoons. Uh, prior to the printing press, mon monasteries were the primary way that you got the printed word out to people. You had monks, and they toiled and copied manuscripts by hand, and they practiced their penmanship very well. And uh, uh, different monasteries um, had different productivities, and you're a monastery tycoon, so you need to uh, uh, figure out how hard your, your monks are working. <coughs> determines the market valuation of your monastery, among other things. So, um, monks copy manuscripts. The problem is they have cellars full of delicious cider, <laughs> so they also get drunk and um, throw wild parties sometimes during the week. And this is all true <laughs> uh, from the historical period. So, uh, the data we're going to be looking at, the outcome variable of interest that you have to evaluate the economic performance of of some particular monastery of yours that you're interested in is the number of manuscripts completed on each day. There's this log book, and then as manuscripts are completed and shipped out, someone writes down in a book how many were completed on that day. So it's a count. It's a, and this will be a Poisson variable, you might think, right? Because there are the manuscript on, on many days, no manuscripts are completed because it takes a number of days by hand to complete a 400 page illuminated manuscript. It can take a while. Uh, so there are many days where none are completed. Some days you get like four. That's like a day where everything lines up right. But there are lots of monks, many, many more monks working in the monastery than any than manuscripts get completed on a given day. It takes much longer than a day to complete a manuscript. Make sense? So very large number of trials, that's monks <laughs> working on manuscripts, and a very small probability of completion on any given day. Binomial shrinks to Poisson. Poisson density uh, does good work here. The problem is, 
Um, there's a heterogeneity in the process because they're not working on every day. Some days the monastery kind of shuts down and drinks, and they go on a bender. <laughs> and uh, on those days there are zeros. They don't produce any manuscripts. But even on days when they work, they sometimes produce zeros. So this is a kind of data that we call zero inflated. There's more than one process that produces zeros in the data. And you can't tell just from the data. Or can you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's the thing we're going to look at. Um, so let me, let's break out the analytical structure of this a little bit. And uh, this is called a zero inflated uh, Poisson process. And this is the most common, I think, zero-inflated model. You can also zero-inflate binomials or any counts. You can uh, win the uh, – well, I'll talk at the end about the, there's a whole family of stuff called hurdles, which are related to this as well. Um, there's a hidden state here uh, generating the data, and that hidden state is whether the monks were drunk or sober on that day. Uh, you can think of this as whether they were partying or working. And uh, so there's an initial probability. You can look at the diagram on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, P of the time, they drink. Right? And uh, then you always observe a zero. Y is our outcome variable, our count, our Poisson count. Uh, one minus P of time they work, but there's some chance that you get a zero even when they work. Uh, and then some chance you get a number greater than zero. So when you observe a number greater than zero, you know they weren't partying on that day. But when you observe a zero, you don't know. And our challenge is to estimate how much partying the monks are doing. And it turns out we can do it uh, when we write down the likelihood in a principled way following this diagram. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to construct a new likelihood function that is a mixer likelihood. There are two stochastic processes in it. The first is binomial. Are they partying or not? There's a chance P, they party. Conditional on not partying, there's a Poisson process that generates completed manuscripts. And what we observe is a mixture of those two things. And at the end, we've lost the partying dice or coin flip for partying. Right? You can imagine the monks have a have a wooden coin on one side is a big frothy sign, on the other side is a quill. And they flip it every morning. And the question is, what's the weighting on this coin? Right. Uh, although I should say, some of you know this. Flipping a coin, it doesn't matter how heavy one side is the other. You can't bias a flip coin. You've got to spin it. Spin it, it'll be biased. But flipping it doesn't work. Because of how angular momentum works. Uh, it doesn't matter how heavy it is. Try it. Put a big wad of gum on the side of a quarter and flip it. It won't matter. Um, so uh, we're going to build a new likelihood. Let me walk you through the idea. Um, we're going to simulate this data later, and it's going to look like this. So I just want to foreshadow for you what the data looks like. Um, manuscripts completed across the horizontal, and just a count, the frequency on the vertical at each of those values over, I forget how many days I simulated uh, this. It'll come out later in the script. Um, what I've highlighted for you is what you wouldn't normally be able to see, is that uh, there are some number of zeros. In this case, all of the ones that are shaded in blue are the drunken zeros. The zeros that arose from party game days. And normally you wouldn't be able to distinguish them, but they arise from the part of the diagram uh, that I put in the blue box over there on the right. Does this make some sense so far? Uh, so let's build this up now. Um, we can derive the analytical form of the likelihood function for this. Now I, I have, of course, written a function in the rethinking library that already does this for you, but I want you, it's important to me for you guys to understand the magic here, right, or the lack of magic. Uh, whatever it is. The guts of the golem here are not that complicated, and these mixture uh, likelihoods are really just cobbled together from the logic of your story about how the data are born. Remember early on in the course I said uh, a really pragmatic way to work towards basic computation is you, you want to tell yourself a data story. Well, that's a generating story of the data. And if you can make that story into an algorithm, you can write it in backwards order and you have a statistical model that can recover the parameters from the data generating process. And that psychological procedure of thinking about the data forward and then writing the model backwards nearly always works. It's a very powerful way to approach it. It takes some practice to get better at it. So this is an example. We're going to think about it going forward and think about writing down the likelihood function from it. So let's go forward for a second, and then we'll write down uh, likelihoods, um, analytical likelihoods that give us the probabilities of zeros and non-zeros. Um, so the first thing that happens is our binomial process. This is P in the time they drink. 1 minus P of the time they don't. Um, so P of the time, we're guaranteed to observe a zero. 1 minus P of the time, there'll be some Poisson process that kicks in. That's the quills paper going. Um, some of the time, that Poisson process produces a zero, and it produces it uh, e to the minus lambda of the time. You're asking, where does that come from? That's the Poisson likelihood function. Uh, so if you Google 
Poisson distribution. You go to the Wikipedia page, uh, you will find the mathematical formula for the Poisson distribution. And if you set the outcome to zero, it reduces to this really nice thing. It's just, it's just e to the minus rate uh, of the process. Um, and that's the probability of a zero out of a Poisson process always. So that's where that comes from. Conditional on their working, the probability of a zero is e to the minus likelihood. Um, and then there's some other probability. If you observe an n instead, the probability of it is that thing, which is just the Poisson, Poisson likelihood. That's what that is. Um, and uh, that's, where does that come from? If you take the binomial likelihood and you take the limit as n goes to infinity and p goes to 1 over infinity, that's what you get. Uh, you get that thing. So now we can think about um, uh, writing down conditional on observing a zero. There are two ways it can happen, and we have to account for them both. So now it's, think about it this way. You've got your data set. There's some case where a zero has appeared. What's the likelihood of a zero? Let's account for all the pathways in this diagram by which a zero can arise, and we have to use them all in the probability expression. And you may remember from probability theory at the beginning of this course or in some former course that when things happen together in probability theory, we multiply them. And when things are alternatives, they happen separately, we add them. So we're going to have an addition in here because there are two pathways to get a zero. So there's an or that appears. Uh, so the first thing that can happen um, is p of the time they drink and we're guaranteed to get a zero. So the probability of a zero conditional on these parameters p and lambda are p uh, or, that's why we add, plus 1 minus p of the time uh, they, they don't drink and the Poisson process produces a zero, which is e to the minus lambda. Make sense? Yeah, it's just, this is all probability theory is. It's just and and or and. or. Be, write down all the things that can happen, figure out all the ways they could happen, count up all the ways that any particular event can arise. Uh, that's all probability theory is. It's just counting. It's a compressed form of counting. Does this make sense so far? Um, next step, what if it's not a zero? Conditional on not observing the zero, the chance is 1 minus p, because we have to get down the right-hand side of this tree, times the probability of any value in uh, greater than zero, which is that expression, lambda to the n times e to the minus lambda over n factorial. Make sense? So we get a likelihood function that has these two terms in it. Conditional observing a zero, the likelihood is up there in the, on the left-hand side of the slide. Conditional observing something greater than zero, it's that thing over there. Notice that even though when you observe something greater than zero, you know it's a Poisson process. You still have to multiply it by 1 minus p because it's they worked and managed to produce some manuscripts. So there's a multiplication. Does it make sense? And I'm not expecting you guys to, this is not a course where I'm going to give you some new mixture situation and you have to derive the likelihood, although that would be fun uh, for some of us, mainly me. But uh, I'm not going to expect you to do that in this course. It's good to know something of the logic. And eventually in your careers, you may have a case like this where you need to cobble this together. And whether you, I think all of you are capable of doing it yourself because I've seen you do harder things in this course uh, than this. It's just that this is unfamiliar. Uh, you haven't done it before. So I want to expose you so that you know it's within your powers uh, to do things like this. Um, it's not that hard. You, like I said, you've done much harder things already. So back, how do we express a zero inflated Poisson model? Um, now, you, you, there are two parameters that describe the zero inflated Poisson distribution, which is a Poisson distribution salted with some extra zeros. Right? It's, got a, it's got a big excess of zeros. So that's why it's called zero inflation. And uh, it's, there are two parameters that describe its shape. Unlike the ordinary Poisson, there's one parameter, lambda, which is the rate for the average number of events per unit time. Uh, and this is mixed with a binomial. Um, distribution, or a Bernoulli trial at the start, and its parameter is p, so uh, the zero inflated Poisson distribution is a function of both of those parameters. So we have two linear models now, uh, if you so choose. We don't have to. Uh, you can just estimate p and lambda, but if you have uh, predictors, you'd like to make the, the, the probability of drinking and the rate of manuscript production conditional on, then you need two link functions and two linear models. And linear models can be completely different from one another, and they have different parameters in them. Uh, they're, they're, it's up to you. They can, uh, so the, the example I've given here, there are two different intercepts, um, two different beta coefficients, and then a common predictor, x, whatever that is, like how sunny it was outside, whether it's inside the drink or not, or you know, how, much, basically how much cider is in the cellar. x could be that. But um, uh, 
they don't have to be. Uh, uh, given your background knowledge of the system, there can be different predictors in these different processes, right? It could be something completely different that determines whether they party or not uh, compared to how fast they produce manuscripts when they're working, right? It could easily be the case. You know, think about grads. I had an older example where it was grad students producing manuscripts, uh, and I thought that was too close to home. So, <laughs> yeah. That's also zero in place. <laughs> um, I have a data set on that. I'm curious sometimes. Uh, so, um, does this make sense? Yeah? Um, why is the second one log instead of the first one? Good question. Why is the second one log? Because that's the Poisson rate, and what we want to do is constrain it to be positive. Lambda needs to be positive. So, the, the customary link when you want to constrain a parameter to the positive reals is to use the log rate. Because if you exponentiate that linear model, it's guaranteed to be positive. Yeah. So we're using the conventional links from the binomial model and the Poisson model. They're still in here, but they're, both processes are in the same model now. Um, OK. So let's simulate some data now. And uh, by the way, there's a, there's a whole bunch of classic paintings of drunken monks. It's, it's really great. Go to Google Image Search sometimes. Just put in drunken monk and hit image. Uh, tons of great stuff. And it's not all Jackie Chan movies. <laughs> Some of it is. Um, so uh, I think it's very important as your models get more complicated and you start to feel yourself being nervous about your conceptualization of the model structure to simulate data out of the process to make sure you understand what's implied. And if you can recover the parameter values from your simulation, at least get the neighborhood of them, uh, uh, then that guarantees that you, your model is working right and that you understand what the model implies generatively about the data. This is a great thing. And when you're developing new models, this is absolutely essential for new model types or fancy code. So for these uh, models, I, I joked to you, I just finished um, uh, a two-week model fit. Uh, you can believe that I started it off this way. Uh, made sure it worked on simulated data first before the two-week run on real data because I guarantee you, I went through many rounds of bugs uh, in my code before I knew it worked. And how did I, how did I assure myself it worked? Because I had fake data where I knew the truth uh, getting in there. Uh, and you kind of you converge on it, and then you trust your software, and you can run it on the real data. Does that make some sense? This is very important. The models in this class are mainly pretty simple, but still, uh, simple is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and you get something extra out of the forward simulation approach. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you that here because it's really simple. Um, and it will give you an example you can scaffold off of in later work. So um, we're going to simulate dummy data, I like to call it. Uh, we're going to recover the estimates, and hopefully this will this will uh, uh, increase understanding of the model. Uh, what we're not going to do in the example here, but I encourage you to try at home, is to try parameter combinations that are extreme. And you can see that sometimes you really can't recover the process uh, because there are ceiling and floor effects in these nonlinear regressions, and that removes information from the data about process. If the processes push things in really extreme directions, um, you can't figure out. There'll be just a bunch of parameter values that are consistent with the data, and uh, absent a psychic friend, uh, you can't recover it. And that's important to know. Now, the, the nice thing about that is the Bayesian posterior will tell you that, right? It'll be Y over some range, because it's telling you the relative number of ways that each parameter value could have generated the data conditional on the model, right? So it isn't going to lie to you and give you false precision. But you shouldn't expect to always be able to recover the data generating process in a nonlinear model. Uh, it's just the way the world is, right? This is called the generalized inverse problem. Uh, you might come across that in, in, in the physics literature. Uh, it's a cool uh, fact about doing science, I think. It makes it fun. Uh, it does. It's because it's there's a problem to solve. You need to find another way of looking at the data, some other kind of data description on a different scale to often to solve those problems. Okay. So, um, let's simulate some manuscripts. Uh, so this code, I want to run through it real quick. Uh, and just so you guys understand how easy this can be, first we just define uh, the probability of drinking. We define the, the fixed true parameter values of the process. The probability of drinking is 0.2. So on 20% of the days, the monks drink. Right? I'm not sure historically what it was like, but if I were a monk, I would drink a lot. That's all I can say. Um, <laughs> just, Sorry, this is probably silly question. But uh, how do you get the point two? Like, I just made it up. Just, oh, right. Okay. You want to try different, like I said, you try different values. Okay, so you just kind of like plop in. Yeah, in. yeah you try different values because you're validating your code and you're trying to understand the model. Does that make sense? It's not, this is not a hypothesis that it was really point two. 
and you're not going to publish these data, <laughs> right? This is about understanding it and making sure the code works. So uh, I, I hesitate to say that value doesn't matter because, again, for extreme values, really high values near one and really low values near zero, you'll see that the estimation problem is a lot harder. Um, it is. For point two, it's pretty easy. I'll show you an example. But you make up the example because it's a form of intellectual play. Does that make sense? It's not cheating, right, unless you publish this, right? <laughs> Which you definitely don't do, I think. I mean, this is kind of the, anyway, no, I'm tempted to t start talking about fraudsters, but I won't. Uh, I was going to say, fraudsters usually, luckily, aren't sophisticated enough to know how to do this. And then they do things like everything's perfectly linear in their fake data. It's like, come on, people. <laughs> it's like, give me a challenge here. The data forensics community is like, whatever. You know, like those, that Dutch social psychologist that made everything like a perfect straight line or something. It was like, come on. <laughs> You're not even trying to trick us, you know. Um, anyway, but you know, if you work in SPSS, it's like, what is a random number generator, right? It's it's an issue, so uh, it's fortunate. <laughs> uh, anyway, you guys are honest, so I'm not worried. Um, so in is uh, <laughs> now there's like nervous giggling in the crowd. Right? <laughs> uh, so uh, well, you're going to publish all your scripts, right? Everything will be audited. Right, so you're in the new generation where everything's open methods and replicable. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. I will haunt you if I follow up on your scripts in there. <laughs> I will haunt you. <laughs> A drunken Irish ghost following you <laughs> into professorhood. Um, so, uh, all right, where was I? Uh, sample one year of production. Um, oh yeah, rate of work uh, on average one manuscript a day. That's the Poisson rate, right there. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a whole year of simulations, uh, just because, and then we simulate um, first the first stochastic process, the one that's latent in the real data that we don't get to observe. Right? We don't have data on this. You could imagine getting data on this, but you, as monastery tycoon, you only have that logbook. And the monks have tried to hide this data from you. If you we're about to recover it because we we're stats hotshots, and they didn't know that. Right? So, um, do they drink or not? Uh, it's, it's a binomial process with one trial, all, otherwise called a Bernoulli trial, um, and you just put probability of drink in there. Drink now holds a bunch of zero and ones, which indicate whether they got drunk on that day or not. Then we pass that drink variable right into our simulation of the Poisson distribution, and notice that, that formula looks like the likelihood that we wrote before. It's one minus the probability of drinking, whether they actually, and now it indicates whether they really drank or not, times a random Poisson uh, number, n of them, uh, with an average value from rate underscore work. Uh, y holds zero inflated um, counts, zero inflated Poisson counts. You with me? That's really all it is to it. Does this help you see what's actually being assumed? Uh, so now let's look at the model. Uh, this model's easier. I'm not going to put any predictors into it, but you add, these are just linear models, so all your previous tricks are fine. You can put interactions in there, uh, whatever you want to do. No guarantee that that you can recover the parameter estimates you want, but, but sky's the limit, right? Uh, let your science decide. And uh, uh, you put this into map exactly as you might expect. DZI plus is a, a likelihood function, a density function that I programmed into the rethinking package. Um, there's a box in the notes where I do the dissection of it and show you what its guts look like in case you ever want to write your own likelihood function. Uh, there's a scaffold in there for you to see how it's done. It's not that hard. Um, but it's one of those overthinking boxes that I say you don't need to read until the second time through the book, right? Okay. Is this any questions about this? The only new thing is that DZI plus is there. Yeah. All right. Um, when you look at the estimates, exactly as you might expect, uh, here's just looking at the Precy output in the middle of the slide. Um, we get an estimate uh, AP is the... Um, uh, log odds of uh, their being drunk, right, drinking on any particular day, uh, and it's minus 1.39, let's call that minus 1.4. Now it's log odds, so to get it back on the probability scale, you plug it into logistic, right? Uh, so I do that down here in the bottom of the slide, logistic of minus 1.39 is 0.1994, which is close to 0.2, which was the data generating process, right? There's a lot of days here, so uh, with 365 days of data, you can get you can recover the process really accurately. Um, same story uh, now for lambda. AL is the uh, log scale um, 
average uh, uh, manuscript production per day, it ends up being very close to zero, 0 0.05. So we exponentiate it to get it back on the count scale. Because of log length, you, un you can use the inverse length. And that is nearly one, which was the, what we assumed about the process. Right? So it works. Make sense? Yeah, question. Um, about the inverse length going from you know, your log scale to the probability scale, when we're plotting the results of the model, do you have to go from the log scale to the probability scale and then plot the probability of success? Yeah, from the from the logic scale to the probability right, scale, right, yeah. or uh, to plot the probability of success, yes, you, you got to get you got to undo the logic transform, right. so logistic it. Um, but you could you could view things in log odds. Right. You can do that. It depends. So that's just, like what we did in the book in the in the book, right? With the pulling the levers, we were just looking at the probability in log odds. You you were looking at probability. Well, there's some graphs where we look at the parameter scale and right. it's on log odds. That's right. And then there are other graphs. The posterior prediction checks are all on probability scale, okay. right? Okay. There again, I'm. I'm this is horoscopic advice time. So in a particular context, I could sit down with you and we could figure out like what's most useful here. There are cases, um, I was collaborating with a lab in, in Lansing. Uh, they may be, uh, hello ISIS if you're listening to this. Uh, uh, they work on ticks, behavioral ecology of ticks. They had this cool project that they pulled me in on. Because I'm a sucker for creepy things that suck blood out of mammals. But uh, <laughs> no, it was a cool stats problem. So it's about tick questing. Uh, so this is what they call it in the tick literature. Ticks climb up on things and they wait for warm objects to pass by, like joggers, and then they jump on them. And uh, so there's this questing behavior where they crawl up on things, but they, they get desiccated really quickly, so they got to go back down into the leaf litter and chill for a while and get their moisture back. And so there's this questing behavior, and they're interested in it. And so they had a bunch of experiments, field trials, with questing behavior of ticks that they measured. Most of the time, the ticks are in the leaf litter. So you want to estimate the probability that they're questing on any particular cross-section. It's really low. So on the probability scale, it's basically on the bottom axis always. But there are big differences across treatments on the log odds scale. And it has huge consequences for the system. Uh, like probably a jogger gets Lyme disease. And so it's a cool problem where in that case, I looked at everything on the log odds scale because you can actually see differences. And they're very reliable differences. And ticks, ticks are savvy little things. Good fancy little spiders. So, yeah, anyway, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, yes, I think I'm done with this slide, right? <laughs> you guys tell me. Yeah, I forgot where I was before I started thinking about ticks again. I'll wear my tick shirt next week. I have this tick, tick shirt they gave me called Gopher Blood. But anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, other mixtures. So let me just review back to this. You can also do uh, zero inflated binomial, um, and there, there's a density in rethinking to do that as well. Uh, you can derive it the same way. It's just the Poisson gets swapped out with the binomial likelihood. It's, it's the same idea. There's a whole bunch of hurdle models that combine some process that generate zeros with a continu a process. If it isn't a failure, you get a continuous reading, some indication, like a gamma distribution uh, or an exponential. So you, those are often called hurdle models. They arise a lot in biochemistry because you're trying to detect the concentration of something in a solution. And your assay doesn't work until the concentration is above a certain hurdle. Uh, so you get zero inflation because there are these low concentrations where it's there, and they all read exactly as zero because the assay just shows up as zero in those cases. This is a common. Those of you who suffered in the bench sciences, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I published a paper two years ago, I think, on human data where the hurdle model was useful because it was foraging trips. So guys go out hunting in the Paraguayan forest and. 60% um, of the time, they bring back nothing. That's a zero harvest is what it's called. Sometimes they bring back a howler monkey. And then you, the, the record is the kilograms of meat that they brought back. Right? So that's a, that's, it's not a zero, you could call it a zero inflated kilogram model, but it turned out to be a, a zero inflated gamma model, uh, which you can construct the same way. Uh, it just deals with the fact that there's two processes that are producing the outcome. Right? Did you get anything and then how big it is? Right? So there's two processes that go on there. So it's also, there are also two process that, processes that produce an outcome. Let's say you just want to measure height of individuals. You have, let's say, environmental processes like nutrition and strictly genetic processes like genes. And yeah. those, are, those are two processes, but you're saying they're not mixtures and they've been fitting. Those look like linear, regular linear models. So what's the, 
Yeah, so there's this, there's this uh, uh, issue of abstraction. When I'm here, when I say different process, different stochastic processes at the level you're representing it. In the in the usual thing, right? We'll say, oh, there's a bunch of small additive effects, and they combine developmentally to produce height. And that's a mixture, sure, of effects. But we use the Gaussian because we think all these small things are added, or we just use the maximum entropy thing that we don't know anything about the process, but we do know it. Essentially unconstrained and continuous, right? Uh, does that help? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the vocabulary uh, the vocabulary doesn't really do justice to all the choices you have to make in this stuff sometimes. Um, question? I think I've seen a number of times where it's like these type of models probably should be used, but the normal binomial you know, plus plus R is being used. Well, what is the consequence of it? Great question. I should have I should have made a big deal out of that in an earlier slide. So the question was. Uh, lots of times we see cases where models like this should be used, but people just use ordinary binomial or Poisson. What's the consequence? The consequence is that you will underestimate the rate. So for the monks, if you assume that they work every day and there's zero inflation, you'll get a lambda that's smaller, right? You'll underestimate their productivity when they actually decide to work, right? Because un unconditional on whether they're drinking or not, their effective rate of production is low. And that's what you'd be estimating just treated it like a Poisson. It, but that's, you're getting the wrong inference, right? Because if you could actually crack the whip and make them work every day, they'd be a lot more productive. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that can be a big deal. And your homework is meant to be a pragmatic, as I said, it's a park management data set that is about this. It's about fish extraction from a national park. It's exactly this problem. Not everybody goes in the park and actually tries to get fish. Uh, but you can't rely upon their testimony about that. And uh, so, anyway, so it might help you think through it a little bit get into it, but it's this issue of getting a more accurate uh, measure of the of the actual rate of extraction. Yeah. Trina. Just kind of to clarify on the genetic thing, if you knew something about the genetic process and how it was not additive, like you knew it's this gene and it has this dominance relationship, then you could use this type of model, right? Maybe. And then the... Yeah, yeah, I, I need to see. I'm uh, Sure, maybe. Uh, again, I'm, I'm stuck in horoscopic land up here, right? And uh, I'm the astrologer, statistical astrologer. Uh, I think, I think often if you want to model development, you can do way better than just saying the outcome's Gaussian. Uh, absolutely. And um, especially if you're, so I know I have some colleagues that work on C. elegans development, and the stuff that they do is scaffolded like these models. You have different stochastic processes, bootstrapping development up that they know when genes turn on. Because uh, we know we know everything about the genome of, of C. elegans, right? Uh, so definitely some hope to do stuff like this. If you know there's a gene that turns on early in, in ontogeny, and it can go different ways depending upon what happens, then that'll have consequences for the distribution of the later developmental processes. So yeah, uh, I could imagine, I guess I just did imagine a case like that, but I've never worked on anything like that. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, and I said continuous mixtures are important. We're gonna focus, we're gonna work on multi-level models to do those. Okay, remainder of today, I wanna start